You're now listening to The Blender with DJ Tony Drake. DJ Tony Drake. And, and, and Miss DJ Gems. And Miss DJ Gems is killing it on the ones and twos. Oh, on WMUC 88.1 FM and WMUCradio.com on the web. You, you ready? Are you ready? Let's, let's go. All right, everybody. So I'm about to go ahead and start this interview. Um, I know you guys have heard of Philadelphia Freeway. I know you guys have heard of uh, Def Jam recording artist Rick Ross. But right now, we have the man who they actually got their name from, the real Freeway, Ricky Ross. Why don't you say what's up to the people? Hey, what's up, y'all? Man, I really appreciate you uh, coming on the coming on the show and uh, and talking to us today. Oh, man, it's my pleasure to be on the show, you know what I'm saying, and, and, you know, try to shed some light on what's going on out here. You know, that's what I've been doing going around here, trying to, you know, basically enlighten our children, man, because I feel that uh, we dropped the ball somewhere. And, you know, some of us even took the ball, like myself, and, and took it in the wrong direction. I feel you. For uh, for those of the listeners who aren't familiar um, with who you are, why don't you go ahead and, uh, and, and describe yourself for them? Well, I'm a... Ex drug dealer, just got out of prison from doing 20 years. Uh, was a major cocaine dealer out at Los Angeles, and you know I spreaded my poison across the country, basically. Uh, and just recently got out. I've been out eight months, and since I've been out, I've been going around, you know, trying to spread the word and, and you know let our people know that there's other ways of getting money than selling drugs. Because uh, what I found out about myself is is I've been dumbed down. You know, I let people trick me into believing that I was something that I really wasn't. You know, uh, that I was a thug, that I was a dope dealer, that I was a gangster and all that other stuff. And I found out that uh, that, that was not me. Those were just characters that I was playing out because other people had me believing that that's who I was. Uh, looking over your bio, you it talked about how you grew up playing tennis and was really interested in that. What do you think, though, was kind of the turning point that made you get, I guess, get your start in selling drugs? And I guess, do you have any advice for people who when might feel themselves? When I couldn't go to college, you know, okay. when I couldn't go to college, I felt trapped. You know, my dream was dead. Uh, so I went back to the streets where I had grown, grown up. You know, tennis kept me in a different environment than, than, than my brothers. Because all my brothers and sisters, they, they were, they were gangbangers. And what I found out after I looked back at my life, had it not been for tennis, you know, I would have been a gangbanger too. So uh, uh, tennis was a blessing for me. And then when when it was no longer there, you know, I turned to what I knew, you know, which was my crutch, which was back to the streets and to my old friends. Okay, I feel you. And you like right now, you talked about um, you felt as though when you weren't able to go to college. Um, you felt trapped. Can you talk to maybe some of the the younger listeners who are who are in high school and talk to them about the importance of um, like getting an education? You know, I couldn't read or write. You know, I was I was 28 years old when I first decided that I wanted to read and write. And when you can't read or write, you know, it, it limits a lot of your opportunities. Your opportunities are very limited. You know, uh, like I discovered some books after I learned how to read that. Had I discovered these books before uh, uh, I got into the drug business, I never would have gotten into the drug business. And had I discovered them while I was in the drug business, I probably would have made uh, 50 times more money. So not being able to read, I was not able to discover these roadmaps to success. And 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 that really hurts us when, when we can't uh, read because there's so much information in the, in the library that... You know, library got to be one of the richest places on the planet. Okay, well, let's also talk about the the connection between, I guess, the, the drug game and the rap music scene. Why do you think it's such a, a prevalent uh, topic in rap? And also the fact that there's so many former drug dealers that go into rap. Do you think there's some type of connection there? Why do you think that's so heavy? Well, I believe that the, uh, uh, the drug game fueled the, the rap industry. You know, most of those guys in the business got their first drum machines from selling drugs so it kind of goes hand in hand 
with, with each other. And, and you know, drugs is, is not uh, biased. You know, it doesn't care what color you are, what creed. You know, hip hop transcends transcends all that. So, so does the drug business. The drug business transcends that. Transcends that. So they're both related in, in both of those aspects. With drug dealers, you know, they're the kind of guys who had an attitude that I'm going to get mine even if it means giving up my life or giving up my freedom. And with that type of attitude, it makes good for, for everything. You know, uh, uh, that's why rappers rap about it. Uh, the women want to be with guys like that there because it's, it's that macho it's that wildness, that untameness that, that's inside of the drug dealer that everybody admires. I was reading up on 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 your bio and you talking about that at one point you you were making three million dollars a day. Yeah, I did. So was that was that three million dollars like profit or? No, 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 not three million profit. I figure a profit probably was like six hundred thousand. Okay, okay, okay. And um, after after making like all all this money. Was there a point where you wanted to stop? Or yeah, I, I quit like a year and a half before I went to prison. But uh, the feds, they, they go back into what you did. They can go back seven years, so uh, it's pretty hard to, to, to beat them. Okay, so you... Um... Once, you start to see, once you start to see the, the, the devastation that you're causing and the people that you're affecting, you know, you're affecting not only strangers but your own family, too. Okay, and I guess what um like can you explain like you coming to this realization that like wow I'm I'm not doing what what I want to be doing or like what I could be doing and uh, want to go know, down the straight and narrow. You know what I never you know when I when I look back on it I never really want to be a drug dealer. I just want to get in, get me a start, and, and get out. You know, but uh, uh, it's something about the drug game where you get caught up. You know, you you get trapped. And it's tough to it's tough to give it up. I mean, you know, you got all the thrills, the excitement, the highs, the lows, everything that uh that that keeps that that, that adrenaline rushing. So you know, you you start to become addicted to it. Okay, okay, I, I understand. I understand. Drug, dealers, drug dealing could be more addictive than the actual using the drug. Okay, okay. It's kind of crazy that you said that um, the the law enforcement went back seven years in order to get you, but they were actually the ones who were supplying the drugs. Well, the government, uh, uh, you know, my 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 supplier, who eventually turned into my informant, uh, was a CIA operative. He was on the CIA's payroll, so technically, yeah, they they were the ones who supplied me with with the drugs. Okay, would. Would you be able to elaborate just a little bit more on that? Okay. My guy that I bought my drugs from, he came from Nicaragua. Uh, they were fighting a war over in Nicaragua called the Contras, the Iran Contras. Uh, this organization was President Reagan's pet peeve. And he wanted to fund this organization, but Congress had outlawed any aid at all to the Contras because of the atrocities that they was doing in their own country. They knew that they were selling drugs, they was killing innocent people, and a bunch of things like that there. But uh, President Reagan, this was his pet peeve, so he wasn't ready to give it up. So what they did is they decided that they would come up with other ways to funnel money to the countries without Congress knowing about it. Okay. I hope I, I, hope I explained it to you. Yeah, but it, it'll all be broke down in the movie. You know, when, you know, when the movie come out, you go see it, it's going to break all that down. In, in layman's term. All right, and can you tell us a little bit about Gary Webb and your relationship with him and how he kind of got involved with, with you? Yeah, well, Gary...